Join me for a hymn sing at the 2024 Issues Etc. Making the Case Conference, Friday, July 12th, and Saturday, July 13th at Concordia University, Chicago. This year's theme, Hymns for the Battle. Learn more and register at issuesetc.org. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is brought to you in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. LHF is a recognized service organization of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, dedicated to translating and publishing the books of our Lutheran faith into more than 100 languages for our Christian brothers and sisters around the world. Learn how you can take part in their work at lhfmissions.org. If there was a one-stop shop resource for Advent and Lent, wouldn't you want to know? Well, there is. It's the Center for Biblical Studies from Concordia University, St. Paul, led by Dr. Reed Lessing. I'm Pastor Matthew Tuman, and I speak from experience, having used these preaching workshops. Offered online and recorded, they have it all. Sermons, slides, liturgical resources, and Bible studies. All for $25. Learn more at one.csp.edu forward slash Center for Biblical Studies. Welcome to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. I can't help but hear that laugh more as a snort than as a belly laugh, as though it were accompanied by a, Seriously, guys? You really think that's going to work? Did you forget who is almighty? The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a daily verse-by-verse Bible study with the church, past and present. Pastor Whedon is leading us in a study of the book of Psalms, chapters 1 through 41. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Greetings, people loved by God. Last time, we just dipped our toes into the Psalter, beginning with the first psalm. I gave an intro that pointed out that Jesus claimed that the Psalter was His, that it spoke of Him, and indeed, that His Spirit speaks in it. And so, when we encountered the blessed man of Psalm 1, we recognized Him not as our pious selves, but as our Lord Jesus. He indeed is the one who did not walk in the way of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, the deriders of God's word. I cited a passage from Wisdom 2 that gives a remarkable and hostile description of that same blessed man who held himself aloof from the propensities of fallen humanity. Jesus has his delight in the law of God, meditating on it, murmuring it to himself, muttering it day and night, It was his constant companion. And because he lived so in his true humanity, he was like a tree beside streams of water, bringing forth his fruit at the proper time, his leaves evergreen, and succeeding in all that the Father had given him to do. He stood in complete contrast to the way of the wicked, who discard the word of God, or even worse, who misuse it for sinful ends. They are just like chaff blown away by the wind. They're not rooted in that which alone can make them stable, the word. So the wicked have no prospect of standing upright, as in being justified, in the judgment, nor holding a permanent place in the assembly of the justified, the righteous. The Lord knows the way of the righteous because it's his way the way of abiding in him and in his word. But the way of the wicked leads only to perdition, to a sad, eternal loss. It's Jesus, then, and being united to him by faith, or it's hell. Those are the two ways. A reading from Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart 
and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Psalm 2, verses 1 through 6. Let us pray. Thanks be unto you, O Lord Jesus Christ, because you were once dead and by your blood redeemed us from sin and everlasting torment. We desire to serve you all the days of our life. Preserve us in the midst of so many enemies, and by your mighty hand, preserve us for your eternal kingdom. Amen. Ready to ponder the start of Psalm 2? Let's work our way through it. Verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? This is 16th century reformer Martin Luther's introduction to this psalm. Listen, Psalm 2 is a prophecy of Christ that he would suffer and through his suffering become king and lord of the whole world. Within this psalm stands a warning against the kings and lords of this world if, instead of honoring and serving this king, they seek to persecute him and blot him out, they shall perish. This psalm also contains the promise that those who believe in the true king will be blessed. So, if in Psalm 1 we met this blessed man, planted firmly beside the river of the water of eternal life, the sacred scriptures, and so given an eternal life, whose fruit fails not, whose leaves wither not, and of whom it is said in all that he does he prospers, we next learn of the opposition that this blessed man, this true king, the anointed of the Lord, faces from the powers that be in this world. They rage against him. They plot against him to destroy him. You know how this came to fulfillment in our Lord's passion with both Pilate, the Roman governor, and King Herod complicit. And it hardly stopped with his passion. It grew even worse after his resurrection And as the gospel of sin's forgiveness in his blood and death's defeat by his victory began spreading all around the world, the powers that be in this age are hugely threatened by a man whom they cannot control and by a kingdom with unseen borders because it is established not on pieces of real estate but in the very hearts of mankind. And it despises the fact that Christians cannot be cowed into submission because they firmly believe that Jesus has defeated death and so suffering for his name is an honor and dying for him is simply being sped into the kingdom of eternal joy. Pardon a musical aside. Leonard Bernstein's Chichester Psalms features an incredible opposition between the opening words of this psalm with their unbridled rage, and then an utterly peaceful Psalm 23, floating above the tempest. I was very blessed to sing those once with Dr. Ralph Schultz of Concordia College in Bronxville directing. The sound still haunts me. It captures the unrest of the nations and the great rest of faith in our shepherd. Sorry for the digression. Back to the text. Verse 2. The kings of the earth set themselves And the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying. Note that the opposition, the revolt, is not just against Jesus, but against his Father. It is against Yahweh and his Christ, who is his Son. As St. John put it so clearly, 1 John 2, verse 23, No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. So to be in opposition to Jesus lands a person finally in opposition to the one who sent him into this world to offer his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. To oppose Jesus is finally to oppose his Father. This is why Jesus himself would say, John 8 verse 19, You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. Commenting on this passage, 5th century Bishop Theodoret of Sire said, Despite their conspiring together 
and hatching a tawdry plot for the murder of the Lord, their schemes all came to nothing, as they were unable to consign to oblivion the one crucified by them. On the third day he rose again and took possession of the world. Not by accident. The book of Acts cites this very psalm in the apostles' prayer as the opposition they faced to spreading the gospel kept growing. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly, in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. The apostles saw that they were living in the conflict that this psalm describes between the true king of the world and the various rulers and pretenders in the great revolt. Verse 3. Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. And what folly is this? To think that puny human beings have the power to rid themselves of God's rule and the rule of his anointed, to whom all power in heaven and on earth has been given. What a hopeless venture! But it does express the exact desire in the heart of sinful man, a desire that the crucifixion manifests. Sinful man would do away with God and with his Christ, precisely, so that we could do whatever we want. We would drive him from his throne that we might plant our posteriors solidly upon it. God's response to this pride, this hubris of his creature. Verse 4. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. I can't help but hear that laugh more as a snort than as a belly laugh, as though it were accompanied by a, Seriously, guys? You really think that's going to work? Did you forget who is almighty? St. Augustine in the 5th century suggested that this is actually a comfort to Christ's own. They foresee what is to come, that the name of Christ and his lordship will spread to future generations and be acknowledged among the nations. And so, they are unable to understand that those others have devised futile schemes. This capacity, whereby such things are foreseen, is God's laughter and derision. I like that. We get a share in his laughter when we remember how futile are all the attempts to suppress his word and to stop the spread of his gospel. God's response is swift and furious. Verse 5. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, verse 6, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I think we do best to hear this as the thunderous approbation of the Father at the revelation of the Son of God on the last day. In that day, his voice like a great blast of a trumpet will disclose the reality that the rebels ran from and tried with might and main to deny that Jesus, the crucified and risen Lord, truly is the King, that he has been installed by God on Zion, my holy hill. That is, he is reigning right now and throughout the time of grace in his church. This is why St. Paul could write so boldly in Ephesians 1. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead 
and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. He reigns now for the good of his church. And on the great day of his appearing, that rule will be made visible and will confront his enemies. Then those words of Jesus will be fulfilled, Luke 19, 27. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Next time, we will finish out Psalm 2 as we hear the Father speak to his beloved Son about his being begotten and how he will make the nations be his heritage and the ends of the earth his possession. He will rule them with a rod of iron, what we call the kingdom of power. And this calls for repentance on the part of the nations, for God is not set on destruction, but on salvation. He invites the nations to do homage to his son and pronounces blessed whoever takes refuge in him. Till next time then, people loved by God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thanks for listening to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a listener-supported program. You can donate by check. Make your check payable to The Word Endures and send it to Box 616, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. You can also make a secure online contribution at thewordendures.org. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a production of LPR, Lutheran Public Radio.